Well, good morning, Scotts Hill. It's great to see you here this morning. Welcome to the 10 o'clock service this morning, right? Yeah. How many absolutely love this time of the year where you get to set your clocks, what, ahead and you lose an hour? How many of you are like me that, that I so want to be prepared for it, but about three o'clock in the afternoon, I freak my wife out. I go reset all the clocks. I set them all an hour ahead, and I do it because I want to psych myself out because I know we're going to lose an hour of sleep. And so the, in each of the services, we have experiencing some lower crowds this morning because some people are going to show up when we're finished here today thinking that they're coming to the service and they're going to miss out on this. But we're glad that you're here this morning. My name is Phil Ortigo. For those of you who may not know who I am, I'm a senior pastor here. We're so glad to have you here this morning. And so we've been studying for the last eight weeks, 1 Thessalonians. It is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of believers in a city called Thessalonica. And we've been unpacking those verses a little at a time, chapter at a time, and we find ourselves all the way into chapter 4 today. So if you have your Bibles, if you have devices, if you have phones, whatever it is, would you locate 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? We're going to begin in verse 9 this morning. Now let, us, let me catch you up of where we've been. The Apostle Paul has a vision, and he goes to Thessalonica. He spends three weeks there, and he preaches the gospel, and many, many people come to faith in Christ. The church is born, and Paul spends some amount of time there discipling them, but he is run out of town by jealous Jews. And he goes all the way to Corinth, and he's in another pagan city called uh, Corinth. And as he's there, he gets word from Timothy, that the people in Thessalonica are doing well. They are living faithfully. They are following the teachings that Paul has instructed them in, and they are doing everything to keep up with what Paul has taught them. And so what Paul is doing is he writes a letter to them, encouraging them to continue to be faithful more and more. And when we come to chapter 4, we see that the theme of that chapter we discovered last week was how to please God. How am I to live my life in such a way that I please him? And last week we saw that the passionate pursuit of every child of God should be to please our heavenly father. Everything I do should be to bring glory to him. Everything I do should be to bless his heart and bring him a great amount of joy. Now let me say this on the outset, that pleasing God is not just about keeping rules. Okay? Just keeping rules does not necessarily please the heart of the Father. You can obey the rules and not please God at all. So it's not about pleasing the rules. It's about pleasing the one who gave us the rules. And the reason we do that is because we want him to be the motivation of our heart. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say a group of boys are walking home from school one day. And they come across this abandoned house, and, and, and one of the kids, the leader of the group, says, hey, let's everybody pick up a rock. And they all pick up a rock, and he says, let's throw it at that window and see if all of us can break the window in that old house. Well, they all pick up rocks except one boy. And the one boy does not pick up a rock. And the other boy says to him, what's wrong? He said, I'm not going to do it. Why, are you chicken? He said, no, I'm not afraid. He says, yes, you are afraid. You're afraid of your daddy. You're afraid of what your daddy's going to do to you if you get caught. And the boy said, no, I'm not afraid of my daddy. I'm not afraid of what my daddy will do to me. I'm more afraid of what this will do to my daddy. You see, there's the right motivation. That should be the motivation of our heart. As I follow the word of God, it shouldn't be out of a fear of what will God do to me if I don't do it. It should be out of a fear of saying, what do I do to the Father's heart if I disobey? When you think of Joseph in the Old Testament, who was sold by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold into Potiphar's house. And as he's in Potiphar's house, he is doing a great job. Potiphar is the, 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 the major executioner of Egypt. He is the captain of the guard. And Joseph is doing incredibly well. But Potiphar's wife comes along, I don't know her name, Mrs. Potiphar. She comes along, and she's starting to seduce him, trying to get him to sleep with her. And Joseph keeps putting it off and putting it off. And finally, he says to 
Potiphar's wife, he says, how can I do this thing to God? He didn't say, how can I do this to my master? He didn't say, how can I do this to you? He didn't say, how can I do this and get away with it? He said, how can I do this thing to God? And because his heart's desire was to please the Father. And this passage is all about how to bring joy to God's heart. How do we bless his heart? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us in verses 2 through 8 that the first way that we please him is I please God when I walk in holiness. We saw that last week. When I walk in holiness, I please God. When I'm set apart from something and to something, I please God. And we are set apart from sin and unrighteousness, and we're set apart to Jesus and holiness. Paul writes it this way in verse 3. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. We talked about that last week. And the word sanctification is a big word, but here's what it means. It is the process, it is a daily process by which the Holy Spirit uses all things in my life to make me holy like Jesus. He uses all things, frustrations, temptations, difficulties, joys, people, all things to make me like Jesus. And last week, we saw the Apostle Paul said that we are to walk in holiness, and he says to abstain from sexual immorality. Now, if you, I want to encourage you, if you were not here last week, go online and watch that. It's an important message for married couples and singles and parents and grandparents and teenagers and college students. It's very significant. But here's the point, that in all that I do, I should be set apart for the glory of God. And what I read... It should be set apart to please the heart of God. What I watch should be set apart to please the heart of God. What I do should be set apart to please the heart of God. And when I walk in holiness, nothing blesses the heart of the Father more than when I walk in his character and in his truth and in his grace. That's what Paul taught us. But today we're going to look at the next two ways that we please God. Not only do I walk with him in holiness, but in verses 9 through 12, the Apostle Paul gives us two other ways that we bless the heart of God. Beginning in verse 9, he says, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the others throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Would you join me as we pray together? Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you, Father, that what we've just read is your very breath. And Father, as we look to unpack these verses, I pray that you would empower me as I teach these things. And Father, you would equip our hearts to hear and to listen and to obey. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Here we find the Apostle Paul gives us two additional ways that we are to please God. He begins by saying, I please God when I walk in holiness. But here's the second thing he says, I please God when I walk in harmony with other believers. You see, he moves from the vertical to the horizontal. He begins with my relationship with him, and that's where it always begins, where I seek to please him. And as I'm walking with him in holiness, then it spreads out to the horizontal. Then I am to walk with other believers in harmony. And this is the way he says it. He says, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the others throughout Macedonia. But I urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Two times the Apostle Paul commends them. He commends them for doing these things well. Two times in this passage he says, do it more and more. But there are four things that he lays out for you and me to do, how we can love one another that produces harmony. You see, because love is a theme of these verses as well. And he says, as you love one another in certain ways, there will be harmony in the body of Christ. So let me give you those ways. Number one, we are to love one another as a family. 
We're to love one another as a family. He puts it this way. He says, now concerning brotherly love. There are four words for love in the Greek. There's one word for love in the English. It can mean anything. I love my wife. I love my dog. I love my car. I love my truck. I love hot dogs. You know, it goes on and on and on. And it means all those things. But in the Greek, there are four words. There's eros, which means romantic love. It never appears in the New Testament. And then there's starge, which means family kind of love. It's a love between a parent and children. And then there's phileo, which is a brotherly kind of love, a brother and sister love, which is related through a blood relationship. And then there's agape. It's God's kind of love. In this passage, the Apostle Paul uses two of those words. He uses phileo and agape. And here he uses phileo love, a brotherly love, which means this, that we are related together by blood. And that blood that relates us together is the blood of Jesus Christ. And so because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I are family. We're brothers and sisters. We belong together. We have the same Savior. We have the same Heavenly Father. We have the same Holy Spirit who is living within us. And therefore, you and I are part of a family. And the family of God will outlive your biological family because we will be together forever in Christ. So there's nothing that brings greater joy to the Father than when his children get along. And when we walk in harmony, it pleases the heart of the Father. Because when we walk in harmony and love one another as a family, we reflect the fact that we are connected together by the blood of his Son. I love the way Peter writes it. He says this, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. When he says this, there are a number of things that he's speaking to us about. He says, as we live as a family, there's to be unity. Now, unity is not uniformity. Uniformity is something that says we all look alike. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm glad you don't look like me. Okay, yeah. Unity is also not unanimity. Unanimity says we all think alike. We don't all think alike. Here's the wonderful thing. As we walk in harmony as brothers and sisters in Christ, we can have differences, but the differences are not the important part. It's the things that bind us together that is the most important thing. And we can walk in those things, disagree with certain areas, and have unity among us. Then he says we're to have sympathy. Sympathy is just simply understanding the hurts and the feelings of other people. I want to connect with you. I want to know what's in your heart. I need some sympathy. I want you to understand me. And sympathy and consideration is really what it is. We look for this all the time. Last week, I was on the couch with my wife, and I had my head on her lap, and I said, Honey, will you love me when I'm old and ugly? And she said, I sure do. <laughs> so just looking for sympathy, you know? And so the thing is, we demonstrate consideration to one another. Brotherly love is community. It's living in a community together of brothers and sisters in Christ and, and tender heart. That's empathy or compassion. That's love in action and a humble mind. We're to put each other first. Let me tell you, it blesses the heart of the Father when you and I love one another as family. And the thing is this, the things that we have in common are greater than the things that we have that make us different. Let me do an exercise for you, and I want you to participate with me. On the count of three, I want everybody to say your full name out loud, first, middle, and last name. Ready? One, two, three. That was clear. All right. On the count of three, I want you to say the last church you attended before you came to Scotts Hill. One, two, three. Some of you have really long church names, huh? On the count of three, I want you to tell me the name of the person who died on the cross for your sins. One, two, three. Pretty clear, isn't it? And what unites us together is the blood of Jesus. We are family. Sounds like somebody ought to write a song about that or something, right? We are family. And listen to this. We're going to be together forever. So you might as well start liking each other now. There's harmony. We're family. But not only are we family, here's the second thing he says. We're to love one another as God loves us. 
This is hard. We are to love one another as God loves us. And I love the way Paul puts it. He says, for you yourselves have been taught by God. You've been taught by the Spirit of God to love one another. Now, the last verse, he uses phileo, which is brotherly love. This is agape. It's God's kind of love. In other words, you and I are to love one another in the way that God loves us. I love you in the way God loves me. And that's what we're called to do. I I love the way John puts it in 1 John. He says, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Now, I want you to notice a few things. God is the one who takes the initiative in this love relationship, doesn't he? God loved you first before you loved him. And we are to love one another, take the initiative in loving one another in the way that God has loved us. How has God demonstrated his love? He sends his son, Jesus, comes in full submission to the Father. Jesus comes and sacrifices his life. Jesus comes with sincerity of heart. When we love one another, we are to love one another the way God loved us. We walk together in submission to one another in a fear of Christ. We walk together in sacrifice, putting others first. We walk together in sincerity of heart, which really means without cracks. There are no flaws. We walk in those ways. And when we live that way, the love of God is manifested in our hearts and our lives through this body. Wow, if we love the way God loved us, there would never be any conflicts. There would simply be submission and sacrifice and sincerity. Robert Coleman has a book called Written in Blood, and he tells a true story about a little brother and a sister. The sister was a little bit older than the brother, but both the sister and the brother contracted a rare blood disease. And the little boy overcame it. He got over it. But his sister, his older sister, didn't. And she was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And the doctor finally came to the little boy, and he said to him, he says, your sister is very sick, but there's one thing that will help her. If you would give her your blood, then she will be cured. And when the doctor said that, the little boy immediately dropped his head. And he just started quivering and shaking. And he started crying. And then he looked up at the doctor. He said, will it save my sister? And the doctor said, yes, it will save your sister. He said, okay, then let's do it. The day came, put him in the bed. She was in the bed next to him. And they were beginning the procedure. They connected the tubes to his arm, to her arm. And he's laying there perfectly still. He's not moving. And he's just watching the blood flow out of his body. He's not moving a muscle. Then when the procedure was over, the doctor said to the little boy, he says, okay, it's done. You can get up. And the little boy asked this question. He said, when's it going to happen? And the doctor said, what are you talking about? He said, when am I going to die? And the doctor realized that little boy thought he was giving all his blood for his sister. And he thought he was going to die. That's a great picture of sacrificial love. And you and I are to love one another the way God loves us. And that produces a harmony that blesses the heart of the Father. Here's a third thing. We are to love one another as one church. We're to love one another as one church. Paul speaks about this model church in the Thessalonians, he says, for that indeed is what you are doing to all the others throughout Macedonia. Here's what Paul is saying. You guys are not only loving each other, but you're loving all the churches. Your love is not staying within the walls of this local congregation. It is very clear that you guys have a love for the big C, for all the churches. For it was the people in Macedonia that they were helping The Philippians, the Thessalonians were helping those in Philippi. They were helping those in Berea. It was this group of people in Thessalonica who spurred the people on to give an incredible offering for the suffering people in Jerusalem. They had a heart for other churches. Here's what they understood. Their role was not to compete with other churches. Their role was to complete the mission of other churches. There was no competition at all. 
And that brings great joy to the heart of the Father because the entire body of Christ, many churches are honoring God. Let me say this. No church is an island in its community. No one church. Because what God does is he plants outposts of the kingdom all throughout the community. And every church is to be a kingdom outpost. And every church is to be sharing the gospel. And every church together should be completing one another for the fulfillment of the preaching of the gospel and the saturation of the gospel in every community. That's what we're called to do. We're called to work alongside other churches. I get so tired of hearing people complain about other churches. Now, it's one thing if they're not preaching the gospel. I understand that. But if there are gospel-centered churches all around us, we should celebrate with them. Let me ask you this question. How would you feel if the church down the road all of a sudden began to experience the power of the Holy Spirit and he is falling on that congregation and lives are being convicted and changed, would you celebrate with them or would you become suspicious of them? How about the church down the road? They're experiencing great growth in their youth ministry. And all of a sudden, they're reaching all of these students. Would we celebrate with them or become jealous of them? How about this? What about church plants that we send out and that we commission and we bless? And they go out and they start growing and they get bigger than Scotts Hill and their influence becomes wider. Do we celebrate or do we become jealous? See, all those things would grieve the heart of the Father. But as we walk together, here's where harmony is. It's not only in these four walls. It's all through our community. Because I want to tell you, God is not only working here. He's working around the world constantly in congregations everywhere. So when you came here this morning, most all of you drove past the church to get here. Some of you are going to drive past numerous churches tomorrow to go to work, to go to school, to go shopping, to drop the kids off and go work out. Whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to pass multiple churches. What would it be like? What would it be like if every member of Scotts Hill tomorrow drives past churches and you pray that God would raise up godly leadership? That you would pray for the pastor that he would be bold and he would speak the truth. That you would pray for the students that are going to that church. That you would pray for the outreach of that church. That you would pray God's spirit would so fall on that place that anybody within the vicinity would be coming to faith in Christ and gloriously saved. What would happen if we all do that? I believe that we would be blessing the heart of the Father. Because it's his bride. And so we're called to go way beyond right here. Here's the last thing. He talks about that there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Who's the all? Other believers. Praying for them, upholding them, working together as gospel outposts for the glorious redemption of our world. Fourthly, We are to love one another more and more. More and more. Do it more and more. He says you're to go beyond this. In verse 10, he says to them, brothers, do this more and more. In verse 1 of chapter 4, do this more and more. What he's saying is this, you guys are doing a great job at it. You're loving one another. It's clear, but keep doing it. Don't coast. Don't slow down. You continue to go beyond even what you're doing now. And I would say this to Scott Seal, it has been easy to pastor this church for 26 years because there is a great sense of harmony among us. I've sensed that for many, many years. And, and this is the opportunity for us to go even further, to go even deeper, and to love even broader than we have ever loved before. Because I'm going to tell you, listen carefully, <sighs> harmony pleases the heart of the Father, but a harmonious church is a powerful church in its community. When you and I are walking in holiness and we are distinctively different from our culture, and when you and I are walking in harmony with one another, then it is an attractive thing to the world. And they want to know, what is it that's making a difference there? But I want to tell you, a church that lacks harmony never impacts its community. 
Never. Because why would anybody want to go there? I was in a hospital one day, got in the elevator. Two nurses walk in. This one nurse looks at the other one, and she just says, do you go to church? And the nurse said, no, nah, I, I don't go to church. I don't even have a church. And this girl over here says, good, you ought not, because I hate my church. I mean, this is a nurse. I hate my church. I hate my pastor. I hate the music. I hate everything that they're about. And she just went on and on and on. And this poor girl over here is probably thinking, well, that's probably why I don't go to church. The doors open. They walk out. I couldn't help it. I walked up to the girl that was doing it. I said, can I ask you a question? She said, yeah. I said, you don't go to Scott's Hill, do you? <laughs> she said, no. Here's what I wanted to say. Well, don't. <laughs> Can you see how dangerous and disastrous that is? Well, when a church walks in harmony, the heart of the Father is blessed and the community is impacted. So I am to walk in holiness before God. I am to walk in harmony with other believers. But here's a third one. I love this one. I please God when I walk in humility with non-believers. I bless the heart of the Father when I walk a humble life before non-believers. I'm going to tell you something. There's something that's ugly about an arrogant, boastful, self-righteous Christian. Nobody wants to be around that person. But when we live in humility before people who don't know Christ, what a wonderful picture and an opportunity for gospel conversation. Paul says it this way in verses 11 and 12. He says, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. There were a group of people in the church in Thessalonica that were a pain. They were creating all kinds of problems. They were involved in everybody's life. They were what Paul called busybodies. They're running around talking about everybody, and they're not doing anything. Some of those believers may have misunderstood Paul's teaching in the second coming of Jesus. We know that he taught them that because we see that in 2 Thessalonians. And so Jesus had, um, um, Paul had taught them that Jesus was going to return. And some of these Christians may have been overzealous. And we know this, they quit their jobs. They gave up everything. They didn't need any material possessions. Jesus was coming back. They didn't need to have a job. Jesus is coming back. They didn't need to have food. Jesus was coming back. And they were very arrogant. They were almost fanatical about it. And they had created tension in the church and a poor testimony outside of the church. So what does Paul say to them? He tells them four things that they need to do to walk in humility. Now, he's not only speaking to that group, he's speaking to all of them. And he says, here's some things that you need to do to help you to walk in humility. Number one, we're to live a quiet life. We're to live a quiet life. You might say, wow, man, I'm just kind of loud, you know. I'm, I'm struck out of that one. Here's what that word means. The word in the Greek literally means this, to be ambitious about being unambitious. Doesn't really make sense, does it? To be ambitious about being unambitious. The best translation is this, to make it your goal to have a quiet confidence in Jesus. That's the picture. Make it your goal to walk quietly. You don't have to be arrogant. You don't have to be boastful. You don't have to be right. You don't have to be number one. You don't have to be the loudest person in the room. You don't have to be the person with all the answers every time. You are to walk in humility. And walk in humility is a resolved confidence that is quiet in Jesus. You can be bold and be quiet. It's not about not being bold. Let me tell you this. Humility is the loudest when we walk in quiet confidence. Have you ever seen a, met a Christian that's so loud and boastful, so loud and arrogant, so loud and embarrassing? 
I have. And it's an embarrassing thing. And it turns people off within the church and outside of the church. But when we walk in this quiet confidence in Jesus, I can speak boldly, but I don't have to speak loudly because it's a confidence in him. Here's the second thing. We're to live a focused life. I like this one. We're to live a focused life. He says this, mind your own affairs. Pay attention to your own life. Don't feel that you have to be involved in everybody's life and know everything that everybody's doing. He calls them in 2 Thessalonians busy bodies. These were people that didn't have jobs. They're going around and they're talking about everybody. They know everything that's happening. They know everything about the situation. And they're constantly yak, 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 yak. And you know what that ultimate leads to? Gossip. Gossip. And that's what was happening in the church. All of us know that kind of person, don't we? The person that knows everything about everybody. If there's any situation that happens in the church, oh, they know it. If there's anything that's going on in somebody's life, they've got information on it. And you know what? They feel empowered with this information. And they feel significant with this information. So what do they do? They share it. Oh, did you know about so-and-so? Oh, well, let me tell you about her before we pray for her. You need to know the details. And they'll start talking and talking. Let me tell you. Let me tell you what gossip is. Gossip's a sin. Gossip is sideways language, sideways talk. And gossip never seeks a solution. Gossip wants you to know my significance because of what I know and what you don't know. And it's the greatest position of pride. And when a person it gossips, they're talking sideways. They're not going to the source that can do anything about it. They're just talking with other people. Let me give you an illustration. If you have something against a pastor or me or some other pastor, and you don't come to us, but you're talking sideways, you're just bringing everybody in on your sin. And nobody's going to do anything about it. The right thing to do is for you to go to the pastor and speak to that person, or go to that leader and speak to that person, or go to that person and speak to that person. When you're involved in this sideways language and talk, it does nothing but harm. Let me tell you how you overcome a gossiper, okay? If somebody comes to you and they say, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, I got to tell you about her. Let me tell you what's going on. No, no, stop, stop right there. I don't need to know that information. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for them, and you're going to lead us. We're going to pray for them right now and you're going to lead us. You shut a gossip down when you do not give it a second. And you put it in a right perspective when you say, we're going to the Lord. Because he's the one that can do something about it. And when a person says, man, every time I tell people stories, they ask me to pray. Well, get the hint. There's a sign there. And it's a sin. And let me tell you, people in the church and outside of the church, nobody likes a gossip. So what he's saying is this, be focused. Live a quiet life. Be focused on your own walk and give attention to how you're living. Now that doesn't mean we're not concerned with the brother or sister who may be in sin, but I go to them and I talk to them. I don't tell everybody else so we can have prayer requests. Thirdly, we are to live a responsible life. He says, work with your hands. Manual labor in Thessalonica was seen to be something that was absolutely detested by the Greeks. They did not believe in manual labor. Manual labor was for the slaves. But Paul says, work with your hands. Set an example among the people there. Work with your hands. Be a hard worker. Because many of these people were quitting their jobs, and you know what they were doing? They were relying on the church. They were relying on people outside of the church to feed them, and they were leading a horrible testimony before the Lord and before lost people. You know, there's nothing worse than a lazy Christian. 
There's nothing worse than a Christian that's always trying to get the easy way out, that's always trying to get out of work, that's always trying to take the easy path, that's always trying to find a way where they don't have to do anything. There's nothing worse than that. Here's why. The Apostle Paul says this, whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. That means this. Whatever you do, you do it as though you're serving the Lord Jesus because you are. I believe this. I believe Christians ought to be the hardest workers. I believe we ought to be the, the, the most diligent athletes on the field and on the court. I believe we ought to work harder than anybody else. I believe we ought to be the best students applying ourselves because we're doing it unto Jesus. I believe we ought to be the best workers on the job. I believe we ought to be the best examples of people around us. All of us have worked with believers who have tried to get out of work. And if that upsets you, can you imagine what it does to the unbeliever? We're to walk responsibly. When I was um, going to college, I had a job doing sheet metal. And I did sheet metal for 10 years. And one day I went to my boss, Dr. H uh, Mr. Henry Rathke, and I had learned this principle of working as unto the Lord. So I sat him down. I said, Mr. Henry, I want you to know something, that my goal is to make you as successful as I can working for you. He said, you want to raise? I said, no, I don't want to raise. Here's what I want you to know. You're my boss, but Jesus is my master and my king. And I'm working, first of all, to please him. And if I work to please Jesus, then you become the beneficiary of that obedience. And I'm going to do everything I can to make you successful. When I was going to college, I had a lot of difficult time matching my schedule to work. And he one day came to me. He says, Phil, I know that you're, you're not getting enough hours, but here's what I've got for you. He gave me a key to the building. He said, here's the key. He says, you come and work anytime you want, whether anybody's here or not here, because I trust you. And I know you're not going to rip me off because you're not going to rip Jesus off. He gave me the key, and I got to work. When I left that company to go to seminary, they had a ceremony for me. They retired my work number. They hung my hard hat on the wall with my work gloves. And the last time I was there, which was a few years ago, it's still there. Still there. That's the testimony we need to leave. We're responsible. You see, I'm to walk humbly among those... <laughs> who are outsiders. Here's the last thing. We're to live an honest life. We're to live an honest life. How do you get the word honest out of that? The word walk properly literally means honestly. It means becomingly. That you and I ought to be the most honest people on the job. You and I ought to be, ought to be the most honest people in school. We ought to be the most honest people with respect to the government. We're to be the most honest people that we can. Why? Because I'm seeking to please the heart of the Father, number one. But secondly, it is a humble approach before those who are outside. Let me just say this. We should live our lives in such a way that our lives demand an explanation from the lost world. I am to live my life in such a way that they want to know What's different? This past Friday, Chris and I went to Sherwin-Williams, which is right down here in Ogden on Market Street on the left. We pulled in Sherwin-Williams. We were looking at some little splotches of paint, and we wanted to see what we, we have a project that we're working on. And while we were there, the two guys that were working behind the counter were having a conversation about another person. Now, I don't know who the person was. They never said his name, but he was a Christian. He was a believer. These two guys were not believers. And we're sitting there listening to this, and we're just smiling. We're looking at each other. And I'm thinking, I wish I knew who that guy was. One says to the other one, he says, man, that guy, that guy is straight, isn't he? I mean, he's the real thing, isn't he? And the other guy says, yeah, man, he lives by that book. He is always quoting scripture, and they're going on, and they're talking about the integrity and the honesty of this believer. That this one over here says, yeah, man, he even told me that he's going to wait until he's married to have sex. And this guy over here says, well, man, that's good for him. It won't work for me. But you know what? Man, that is incredible. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, I wish I knew who that guy was. 
Anybody here work for Sherwin Williams? Because that guy left a testimony that demanded an explanation of what's different. We please the heart of the Father when we walk in holiness. That's that vertical. We please the heart of the Father when we walk in harmony. We please the heart of the Father when we walk in humility. So let me ask you these three questions in closing. Number one, what passions are keeping me from a holy life before God? What passions are keeping you? What kind of passions are, are preventing you from living a life that is absolutely pleasing before the Lord? You know what they are? It may be something you're watching. It may be something you're reading. It may be something your eyes are attuned to. It may be something in your heart. It may be a habit. It may be a stronghold. But you know what it is. And the Father is saying to you today as a believer, name it. Confess it. Ask God to cleanse you from it. Secondly, what people are keeping me from a harmonious life in the body of Christ? What people? Now, I don't mean that as a victim. Oh, that person's keeping me from walking in harmony. Maybe, but here's why. Is that person keeping you from walking in a harmonious life because you refuse to forgive him or her? There's some of you who have been hurt by people in the body. It may not even be this church. It may be another one. And you left that church because of the way you were treated. And you have bitterness in your heart. And even though you're in another congregation, you know what you're doing? You're bringing that bitterness with you. And God is saying to you, release that person. Forgive them. It may be that you're the person that needs to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you've hurt someone. Maybe you've said someone. And it's created in you something of bitterness. And you need to go to that person and say, will you forgive me? I was wrong. Because if we're going to love each other the way God loves us and God has forgiven us, it is unconscionable for us not to forgive others. Here's the third thing. What practices are keeping me from a humble life among non-believers? Am I a busybody? Am I responsible? Am I quiet? Am I walking in humility in such a way that my life demands an explanation? Let me tell you a wonderful thing about this church is I have watched you for years and years walk in harmony. I've watched you for years and years to make a commitment to holiness. I've seen so many of you and testimonies of you on the job and it's impacted the culture. But here's what I would encourage you to do. Do it more. Go beyond what you've done and bless the heart of Almighty God. I'm going to ask you to stand together. I want to lead us in a prayer for Scott's Hill, that we would be the kind of church that pleases the heart of the Father in all things. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the simplicity of it, so simple. Holiness and harmony and humility. Father, I pray that you would make us a people of holiness, that the one thing that would stand out about Scott's Hill in this community is that we seek to please you. Father, I pray that you would make us a people of harmony, that we would love one another and love the other churches in our community. And Father, we would be committed to one another in the way that you were committed to us. And I pray, Father, for our humility, that we would walk carefully in this world with non-believers and father they would see our lives in such a way that our life demands an explanation and we have the opportunity to share the gospel 
Father, would you make us that kind of people? And Father, I realize that there's some here today that do not know you because they do not have a relationship with your son. I pray, Father, that even today that your spirit would begin speaking to their own hearts, that your spirit would teach them the truth about your love for them and sending your only son to die on a cross, to rise from the dead, and who is alive today who can give them an abundant life. I pray, Father, that you would use us to encourage them in that truth. And, Father, you would bring a change in their hearts as they yield to the Lordship of Jesus. Father, as we go out today, may we be the kind of people that please your heart. And we pray in Father's name, in, in, in Christ's name, amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.